<laughs> oh, were we, was I singing a key you don't know it in? Different, you know it in a different key? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, um, I, we almost did, and we'll have to do this soon. Um, for those of you who don't know, we went and we brought uh, communions, communion to um, Edith Kelly, which, if you haven't met her, she's just a delight. She's a joy, joyful person to get to interact with. Uh, I guess you learn a thing or two when you've been around over 100 years. Uh, but um, we, she loves old time hymns, so I brought my guitar and we did a rendition of some old time hymns, <laughs> or our own rendition. But I think she had fun. I think she really. Yeah. So we're gonna do. Um, we'll we'll try it. I wanna I wanna get better on some of these. So a few that we want to do there, we'll do here. Yeah. Um, in fact, I worked on today, she really wants to do when the role is called up yonder. So we'll pull that one out and some, some good oldies that she loves. Um, but anyways, uh, moving, let me move into what I want to share with you this evening. And I'm, like I said, I'm going to keep this really tight. Originally, I was like, oh, we can go over the Gospels. I can tell them a little bit about each one. And I'm like, you can't get that done in the time you have. But I put together a, uh, a handout, which is... Uh, should save you a whole lot of learning curve and it could be really helpful as a guide if you want to read through the Gospels on your own. And I'll just show you what's in this handout real quickly. Now I'm going to say a quick word about what's not in the handout to give you some background on what is a Gospel. I don't know that we really stop and think about that and I want to put maybe some perspective to it that you don't already have. Um, if you look on the back side of the sheet that had the uh, songs on it, there is a little 40-day checklist for anybody who would like to systematically go through the Gospels. I set this up for Lent this past year, and a lot of people really enjoyed it because it was simple, it's not a lot of material, it's two or three chapters a day, and a chapter you can read in a handful of minutes it would probably take you less than 10 or 15 minutes to do any one of these readings. And I, I varied it a little bit. You'll see some days where you have two or three chapters, and some, there's one or two days where you just have a chapter, and that would be because it's a day where it's a really long chapter, and I, I tried to keep the, the readings pretty comparable day to day. There are some tips that I have learned the hard way on the sort of facing part of that page. Um, your big kids you can read for yourself but just to hit the highlights the one that I would most emphasize if you're not reading daily and you would want to do something like this to start reading daily the tip that hands down is probably the most important tip there is that first one of deciding where and when you're gonna read that may sound crazy but if people just kind of say, oh, I'm going to do it, and they go into their day thinking, I'll do it sometime, it doesn't happen. It gets crowded out. I started years ago, I started a Bible study program online for folks, and I decided to survey people after 30 days and see how they were doing. And one of the questions I asked was, did they have a set time and place for when they would do their reading? The people who did were five times more likely to still be reading. Five times is like, I mean that's crazy that by that one choice you increase your chances fivefold of sticking with it. So the others I'll just, they're, they're common sense, but what's the old saying? Common sense ain't so common, you know? <laughs> so sometimes we need it spelled out for us, um, but they really work. I've, I've used these tips with many, many people they really work if you're not reading daily and you want to read daily it's a great way to get started here's what I the, in the rest of the sheets I will not walk through those what I did is in case you do follow that I kinda gave you this is like John's cliff notes if you will to the Gospels I went through multiple commentaries multiple Bible study books and from my own reading I put together kind of the basic information that you need to know about each gospel, like who we think wrote it and when and what their, the main themes were, because every gospel has a different emphasis to it. They, they have some things that they emphasize over others. Just to give you an example, 
the Gospel of Mark, which is the shortest gospel, uh, we're pretty sure it was written in probably out of Rome around 65 AD, which would have been a time when people were really being heavily persecuted, and they would have been mostly Gentile, non-Jewish Christians. And that is very different than Matthew, who is writing most likely from Jerusalem and writing to a very Jewish audience. And so he has a very different emphasis on what he lifts up. Uh, if, for example, in Mark, there's a lot about the authority of Jesus and Jesus as a suffering servant, which for the people who are in Rome and they're being persecuted, that would be meaningful for them to know that, one, Jesus had authority over everything, the wind, the waves, life, death, that Jesus had ultimate authority, even though they may feel like they're at the hands of authority that is very threatening to them, there is a higher power than that that they have a relationship with. So that's just to give you an example and I spell those out on those pages. Now here's what's not in those sheets. Um, I wanted to slow down and raise the question of what actually is a gospel and how did we get them and I'm going to tell you that in a, all of about five or six minutes. I think I can do it that quickly. Um, we have the, there's a Greek word and I don't expect you necessarily to remember this but the Greek word that we get go a gospel from is, in Greek, it's euangelion. I don't expect you to remember that, but that's two words. The eu part on the front end means good, and this angelion is a message. You might hear a word in there that you know, angel. An angel is a messenger. It's a good message, good tidings, glad tidings is what gospel means literally. A lot of people know that. What a lot of people don't realize and understand is that while gospel is a very specific term today that by and large only relates to the Bible. I mean, we don't talk about any other gospels per se. We, we might use it as kind of a figure of speech where we say, oh, you know, if Joe said it, it's the gospel, meaning, you know, like, it's got to be true. Um, but as far as something being labeled a gospel, it by and large is our understanding is exclusive to scripture around that. That was not the case at the time that the gospels were written. In fact, that term, a euangelion, a good message, a, good ti a glad tiding, that, that language was in place before Christ and before the Bible came into being. So that when people read that first, for the first time, like the Gospel of Mark, there would have been a preset in their brain for what they expected. Because a glad tidings or a euangelion when it was sent out, almost always was some kind of news about the emperor or a ruler, usually the birth or the ascension to a throne. So if they picked up a document and it began with the euangelion of Mark, they're expecting that Mark's about to tell them something about the emperor, some huge big news. So they would have had a very different mindset when they open this thing up and they look at this scroll and they start to read it. They would have been thinking, okay, I'm about to read about Caesar or I'm about to read about a king or a... Well, they were, <laughs> you know, it was fitting to use it, but at the same time it would have been jarring because they would have started reading it and then all of a sudden it would have been like, well, I'm reading about that Jesus of Nazareth fella. This isn't about Julius Caesar or Pontius Pilate or some other big political figure that they were used to. So that would have been something that really would have captured people's attention because the way it was put. I don't know what to compare it to today unless maybe I sent you something and I put it on like White House stationery. <laughs> Suddenly you go, oh, what is this? You know, why is John writing me on White House stationery? Because that form would have flagged in your head, oh my gosh, this is about, you know, our king, emperor, president, ruler, whatever, you know, your, our leader. Um, that's kind of what they would have experienced. And the Gospels were first probably a lot of the stories were shared you know orally the disciples would have told stories over and over again at some point 
you know, these guys start getting older and go, we got to get this stuff down, you know. <laughs> and particularly when they start hearing stories pop up that aren't correct. And then it becomes a matter of, okay, we need to get it down so that it's accurate. And if you look like at the beginning of Luke, Luke makes it very clear. He says, I'm writing this so that you'll know the accurate history of what happened. And he even alludes to knowing about some other documents about Jesus. And that's the, la the last thing I want to share with you is we kind of, there, we have four Gospels. Three of them, you probably already know, are very, very, very similar. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are very similar and are referred to sometimes as the synoptic Gospels, meaning kind of the same. And then there's the Gospel of John. And that guy's out on his whole own limb, all right? It's a very different, I mean, the, the facts and the details are the same, but the feel of it and the nature of that gospel, very, very different character to it. We suspect that the way those came into being, I'm going to show you something real quick and then we'll wrap up. Oh, I left my chalk in my office. All right, I'm not going to show you on that. I'll just do this, okay? Um, we suspect uh, that Mark was the earliest gospel that it was most likely, it's the shortest one, and we suspect it was the earliest one. There's a lot of different reasons for that. I'm not going to go into that. We could spend a whole evening just talking about why we know the things we think we know. But Mark, we think, was the earliest. And then we had Matthew and Luke come along. So I'm going to put Mark up here, and Matthew and Luke come along. And if you look at Matthew and Luke, you're going to find things that it makes, it looks pretty obvious that he had access to Mark and that they're repeating stories that they know from Mark with a little bit of their own twist or spin for their audience. So, for example, Matthew may take something from Mark and he may make the language fit with a Jewish audience better because he's got a different audience. Uh, or like, for example, he may layer in a reference to an Old Testament. Like Mark will tell a story, well Matthew will tell it just the way Mark did, but then say, and this was so that the prophecy from Isaiah was fulfilled, da 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 Which Mark's audience, they didn't care about that. They weren't Jewish. <laughs> Matthew's audience, yeah, I need that. So we got Mark, Matthew, and Luke, and Mark and uh, Matthew and Luke are borrowing things from Mark. They're using things right from it, and probably literally right from it, because down to punctuation, some of those things are identical. But then there's this curious thing somebody noticed, and that was that Matthew and Luke, they share some material that doesn't show up in Mark at all. So they've got some stuff that's identical, but it doesn't show up in Mark. And what we suspect is, what the theory is, and there's a lot of consensus for this, is that there was another document that they were both drawing from. Like when Luke talks about he's looked at other histories or he's looked at other documents, we suspect this was one of them. And we suspect that it's a single document and it was a written document because there are about three or four things that just exactly line up. Sometimes the wording is identical. Sometimes the um, order of things that are in there are identical. And thematically, a lot of the information is very similar. There are almost, a lot of times, it's um, like short sayings, almost like the Proverbs. You'll get these short little things that Jesus says that are little mini lessons almost in a sentence. Um, there are a few things that are particular um, to Matthew and Luke that we think were from that, like Jesus' temptation and the Beatitudes don't show up in Mark, but they show up identically in Matthew and Luke or with very, very minor differences. So we think that Matthew had, this is sometimes called the four-source four source theory, because we think that Matthew had some of his own material, but he also borrowed from Mark in this other source, which over the years it's been called Q. And you'll be like, Q, why Q? <laughs> Q was for a German word, which means source uh, Kell or Quell, I'm not, not sure how you say it. It's Q-U-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Anybody German here <laughs> or know that? All right. Um, well, anyways, it comes from a German word meaning source. 
by, from the guy that kind of came up with, early guys that came up with this theory. So Matthew has his own stuff. Then there's Mark, and Matthew borrows some from Mark. And then there's this Q thing that he borrows some things from as well. And then Luke had some of his own things that were just, you know, unique to him. And like Matthew, seems to borrow from Mark and Q. So, um, yeah, we, we suspect Mark was the earliest. I don't know how late the latest one was, and we suspect Mark was around 65 AD, and then the others scattered out shortly after that. Um, but yeah, they weren't, you know, they didn't plop down and write them all, you know, concurrent with each other. Um, and they, they even suspect, some scholars suspect that the, the Gospels got annotated as they, you know, like they wrote some down and then said, oh, what, you know what, we need to add this. Because what we have are the Gospels were put together from having hundreds of manuscripts where we might have a few verses from Mark over here in one, and then we have several chapters of Mark someplace else, and then they overlay those things together until they could reconstitute what they think was the original document. Uh, I always thought that, like that, uh, what I always said, that, that's like if someone sees a car wreck, and this one wrote it this way, and this one wrote it this way, and that one yeah. wrote it that way, but it all was the same wreck. Right, right, exactly, exactly. And, you know, sometimes people are concerned because those things got copied and copied and copied and copied, and they're like, oh my gosh, how do we know it's just not completely distorted? But unlike playing telephone, you guys all play telephone as kids, right? We whisper something to somebody and they whisper it and by, you get to the other end of the room and it's nothing like it started. Well, the difference is we have, first off, it's written. <laughs> you know? So it's very easy to stay accurate with it. And particularly later on when monks were transcribing and creating copies, if you made the most minor error, they would destroy the whole document and start over. Um, um, we've got, yeah, yeah, well, we've got, um, we've got lots and lots of copies, but we also have records of people who were writing about what they had. So we have, you know, just like we have commentaries today where you can go buy a book about the book of John. Well, early on in the church, there were what we call the early church fathers, and they were writing about the Gospels. So we have not only those early documents, but then we have people who are writing about them and they're quoting them and we're finding the quotes match with the manuscript we have. Does that make sense? No, no, that's a good question. So, you know, there's a lot of things that feed into this. Um, and if you're ever looking in a Bible, sometimes you look in a Bible and it'll say down at the bottom something like, some ancient manuscripts say, and there'll be like a little bitty phrase difference. That's where we have somewhere in the dozens of manuscripts, one of them has a slight variation in it. And, you know, like maybe an extra phrase. Um, and the bottom line is, though, that the reality is, some people want to look at that and go, oh my gosh, well look, see, it's messed up. There's this, well, nine times out of 10, it's probably more like 98 out of 100 times, those differences have no impact on the meaning or, you know, or, or, or the content, really. They're very, very small, uh, minor differences. So, um, so it's really fascinating. It's really, truly a miracle that we have an amazingly complete scripture in front of us. Um, and it took centuries to kind of decide, okay, what all are we going to keep? You know, which ones are, we, which ones are going to be part of the Bible? What's that? Who decided that? There were some councils. That would be a whole other lesson. But <laughs> there, were, there were some councils of the church early on who started to look at Scripture and say, okay, which of these... Because there were things that were tossed out, and there are things that we have that were greatly debated. Like, for example, the book of James, which we all just take for granted. Uh, Martin Luther really did not like the book of James and really felt it probably should not be in the Scriptures. Right. There's so much emphasis on works in it, and Martin Luther was so focused on 
faith, saved by grace through faith, that he felt it was almost antithetical to the gospel. Um, but the broader church voice said, no, we think it's authentic and it needs to stay. And we could debate James for a bit, you know, because James, I think, ultimately was not at all about works either. He was about faith too. Um, but, all right, well, I want to wrap it up. I don't want to run us too late. Um, um, was this helpful? Do you find this helpful? Good, good, good. Um, and I've got, you know, if you have questions about this handout, I know it's a ton of information. If you decide to read through the Gospels, um, what I'd encourage you to do is read what's here for that Gospel before you read it. And every couple, three, four days, something like that, I go back and skim it again because it's going to change how you read. You're going to pick up things that you just never noticed were there. Um, well, let's wrap up with prayer. And um, I've enjoyed getting to do this with y'all. Let's pray. Most Holy God, we're thankful for the opportunity to gather as family and learn and eat and enjoy and laugh and sing and all those good things. Uh, be with each person here. Bless them throughout the week. Watch over them and may your spirit guide and lead them in their daily living. Uh, also, Lord, we pray that all that we do, whether it's this lesson or how we behave when we walk out these doors, that it gives glory and honor to you. We thank you, Lord, for loving us through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, John. I really enjoyed the lesson. Good, 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 good.